Good morning, family. That guitar's real loud in my ears. Is that real loud in your ears, too? All right. Well, how y'all doing? If you're, uh, if you're visiting with us today, we're super excited that you're here, that you chose to come and spend a Sunday with us. Um, we would love to have you fill out one of our connection cards. Uh, they're you can get them up at the front desk, but there's also a QR code on the back of some of the chairs that you can scan and, and do that electronically. It's real easy. We just would love to know that you're here and uh, if we can be praying for you in any way or if you're interested in how you can get more connected or learn more about Creekside, um, we would uh, we'd just love to hear from you. Um, in, also in the backs of some of the chairs and, and by the communion elements there are some prayer cards. If you, if you didn't grab your communion on the way in, you can grab that now or you can wait until that communion time. We'll give you a minute to go grab that as well. But those prayer cards, if you do have a prayer need, we want to know about it. We're a church that wants to be praying for one another. And uh, one way we do that is just by, by filling out those prayer cards. And that can be uh, a public prayer request or you can mark that that's a private prayer request only for our ministers and our elders um, to, to see and, and have uh, be praying for. Um, and when we uh, collect the, the communion cups after communion, um, the ushers can grab those from you as well. You can also drop them in the boxes in the back if you just want to do it that way. But we do want to be praying for one another. So take advantage of that. I um, also want to let you know that you can you can give online or, or through our church center app or or in those box those lock boxes in the back. We don't uh, we don't pass baskets around. So I um, just want to remind you all that it's another way that we worship here at Creekside is by uh, trusting the Lord with our resources as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to give you a quick uh, heads up about uh, the Dwell app that we're going to be using. And you can download it on whatever app store you use. It's just called Dwell, and it's got the little heart logo there. And that's going to be uh, coinciding with our, our series that we're about to start today. Um, and so you'll have access to that through our group. We have a church group that gives you 30 days of access to that so that you can follow along. It's got daily scriptures, and uh, you can it'll read it to you. It's got, like, a bunch of different voices to choose from and background music so that you can, like, just kind of set that atmosphere of, of, of diving into God's Word. And so take advantage of that. Clint's going to probably talk about it a little bit more in the sermon, but I wanted to give you all the heads up on that. And uh, with that said, we're going to go ahead and get into some worship. As soon as I turn down this guitar in my ears because I've got it blasting. Oh, now it's gone.
the stories told, all the miracles, would you do it again, do it again? You said, consecrate yourselves to me. for something new from you, Lord. We're crying out that we would be taken to a new place, led into a deeper place, more aware of your Holy Spirit, Lord, more willingly led by your hand. God, that we would just be people walking in obedience and, and a people just on fire with passion for your word and passion for your kingdom, Lord. Let this, let this casual Christianity just stop, God. Break us out of this, this, this rut, God. Break us out of this American Christian church formula. God, we wanna be your people. We don't just wanna be some members of the community that show up at a building and talk about you and sing songs about you, Lord. We want to be on the move for you. We want to be on fire for you. We want the world to see how good you are because they can look at us and see how crazy we are with, with just this, this fervor for our God, this excitement about who you are, Lord, and everything that you've done for us. The infinite love and mercy and grace. The, the Savior who conquered death and, and brings us out of death with him and promises us eternal life, God, that this message would not just be passe or, or just played out, God, but it would be something that continues to spark just passion in us. God, we know that we can't just stir that up on our own. We can't just play the right chords and build up the right drum breaks and write the right melodies and preach the right sermons, Lord. We can't serve enough and, and sign up for enough projects. And we can't spend enough time just reading the word, God. We have to be transformed by your word and by your spirit. And so as we sing this song, Lord, we're just crying out for more of you in us. Less of us in our own desires, less of us in our boring human ways, Lord. Shake us up, light us on fire with your spirit. We see you moving in the world right now, Lord. We see the things that you are desiring to do, Lord. We know that you are just as hungry for a move as we are, Lord. And I would just ask that you would help us to make way for you. We would just lay ourselves down in your path and say, Hosanna. May the King come. May he 
reign forever. May nothing ever be the same because of you. take communion together now family let's remember our savior let's remember his great sacrifice and his great love well good morning church uh, if you haven't already uh, grab one of the uh, communion cups in the back on the tables uh, I, I think this is the most sacred time of our worship each week uh, as we come together and we have the the privilege to remember the body and the blood of Jesus and, and I often like to think of myself in the upper room with the 12 uh, when I do this and just um, just give great thanks and praise for, for salvation and for his love so let us bow together and offer thanks for the, the body and the, and the blood and uh, honor our Savior Father we thank you for this uh, this sacred moment, Father, when we can come together as your children in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, take the bread and the cup which represent the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you gave the very best from heaven. You held nothing back. You loved us so much, Father, that you didn't want to be without us. And we needed a Savior, and you sent your Son to be that perfect sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for washing us clean. Help us to allow this uh, meal here to uh, empower us and embolden us to share our faith and to live lives like that of our Savior Jesus, through whom we pray. Amen.
shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? But no one was able to open the scroll and read it. But one of the elders said to me, look, the lion of Judah has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll. Then I saw a lamb that looked as though it had been slaughtered, but was now standing beside the throne. And when he took the scroll, I heard the voices of millions of angels around the throne and they sang in a mighty chorus worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah
great honor to lift you up and proclaim your holiness and your righteousness and your conquering, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We just ask you to draw near to us as we go into the rest of this service. Rend our hearts, Lord, with the truth of your word and the leading of your spirit, that we would be changed and transformed into your likeness. Jesus, the perfect man who is slain, who is worthy of all praise. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Pastor Clint to come up now. Lead us in a time of commissioning. I want to invite uh, Isaiah Haywood uh, to come up on stage with me. Isaiah uh, is someone that we have been praying uh, about for quite some time now. Uh, a good portion of that time, we didn't know we were praying for him. Um, <laughs> But we were definitely praying for uh, someone who loves the Lord uh, and loves teenagers and wants to see teenagers uh, come to know Jesus. And uh, so the Lord sent us Isaiah to, uh, to come and lead our student ministry. And uh, we are just so, so thankful uh, that he has done that. I want to encourage you to get to know this guy. Um, he's, uh, he's just a wonderful guy. And uh, I know that... <laughs> Um, I know that uh, we're going to have a, a good, uh, solid, long relationship with him, and um, we're, uh, we're just thankful. And so I want to invite um, our uh, ministry team, uh, our elders, um, and spouses as well, if you're available and able to come up here uh, on the stage. Uh, also, I want to invite a very special group of uh of folks who have helped us uh, in the process of uh, getting Isaiah, uh, and that is uh, our search committee. Uh, we had uh, eight individuals who were helping us with our search committee, so y'all come on up and join me. Ministry team, y'all come on up. Y'all were slow to the, <laughs> I was thinking, man. One of the things that we're determined to do here is to wait on God for Him to show us who will be in our staff. We've, we've waited a long time for Isaiah. Eight months we were looking and didn't know what God had planned, but we kept saying, send us the person, send us the person, let us know who it is. And when Isaiah showed up, it, he was the person. Truly blessed. And uh, so let's pray together and... Uh, Pray for all these folks up here that were participating in this. This lovely lady, and Anna, and Anna, Anna's behind me, uh, that took care of our kids while we were in this process. And what a blessing. And uh, what a blessing for you to have these folks too. So uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you're our God. We can trust you. And, and know that you will bring us uh, 
and lead us in the direction we need to go and bring us Isaiah. He's going to be such a blessing to these teens and uh, for not only now, for the years to come. Uh, they're going to love him and he's going to lead them uh, in your ways. Teach them how to wait on you, how to love you, how to trust in you. And so uh, we lift Isaiah up to you, Lord. Ask your spirit to just indwell in him that he will listen to the things that you want him to, to do and to say and uh, to be a part of these teens' lives and their families and to uh, draw them closer to you. Lord, it's, it's one thing to say we're a discipling church, but to do that is, is just waiting on you and listening to you and doing the things that you want us to do. So, Lord, we thank you. We, we pray your blessings on this youth group. We pray for Isaiah and not only with the youth group, but with this church and his leadership in, in, uh, in touching people's lives and making a difference for you. So, Lord, we lift this all up to you in your son's name. Amen. All right, well, let's just uh, take a moment to greet one another and, uh, and say hello. And uh, also, this is the time when fourth and fifth graders are going to be dismissed to go to, uh, to Creek Kids. So it's awesome, to, uh, it's awesome to experience all the blessings that God is, uh, is giving us here uh, at Creekside. Certainly Isaiah is one of those, um, and we definitely celebrate that. Uh, but God really does seem to be on the move um, here um, as well as, uh, as in our country, and that's just an awesome thing uh, to be part of. And so we just give God praise for that. Um, we also uh, want very much for Creekside to be um, a place where we uh, are developing disciples. Our, uh, our whole vision is living discipleship. Uh, and the thing that goes along with that is um, a, a purpose statement that, that, that says that we want to uh, equip and we want to, uh, we want to train people to also be and make disciples. Uh, and, and that's really what this is all about. And so we've come to the time in our service where uh, it's our, uh, our opportunity, our reminder uh, to continue to give. Uh, this church has been so awesome over the last several months, especially as we've been going through our capital campaign, uh, which is going awesome. And uh, we're, we're very, very uh, excited about the things that are to come. Uh, with that, uh, you received, if you didn't come to our financial meeting last week, um, definitely you should have received an email this last week that gave uh, several exciting updates uh, on things that are going on. And so you'll be hearing some more uh, about those things as well. But God is just so good. And um, I just want to take a moment to thank God for how good he is. Um, and uh, we definitely want that to not only be something that we do with our words, but something that we do with our actions, something that we do with our resources, including our money. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that you can give. We have offering boxes in the back. You can, uh, you can drop a check or cash in those. You can also give online. Uh, so many of you do that, and we just uh, we appreciate it so much. Uh, so let's just pray together that God would, uh, would use us, would use um, every bit of us uh, in his kingdom. Let's pray together. God, we are uh, thankful that you see fit to, uh, to use us for your purposes. God, I pray that every piece of, of us will be an offering to you um, towards that end. God, we want to see people come to know you. We want to see you use 
this church, this body of believers, to see that happen. Uh, God, we do, uh, we do pray uh, for miraculous um, things to happen in our midst that, uh, where it's just so obvious that it's all you. Um, God, we pray that that would be. We pray these things in Christ. Amen. Well, uh, one of the also incredibly exciting things that uh, is happening is when God uh, brings us new folks. And we did have a Creekside Basics um, class uh, a couple of weeks back. And there were uh, three different individuals that said they wanted to be members. Uh, well, an individual and then a couple of families. So I just wanted to introduce those to you. Uh, first, we have Zach Thurston. And um, excited to have Zach here with us. Zach has uh, already uh, been uh, spending some time with our praise team and um, just really love and appreciate him. And then we also have, next, we've got Logan and Annalie Hull. And um, you may have noticed that, that Logan was, was drumming this morning and uh, he does an awesome job for us. Uh, and then their two daughters, Quinn and Micah, and uh, we're just so, uh, so thankful uh, to have this family with us. Uh, then we have Tim and Amanda Payovich, and uh, their sons, Reese and Reed. And this family's been with us for a little while now, and here's a great example. You may have been with us for a little while now and still haven't come to Creekside Basics. Uh, you can still come. And uh, we're just, uh, we're really excited about the Payovich family, and uh, I'm just glad to uh, get to walk this journey uh, with them as well. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This scripture was actually, uh, was actually mentioned um, a few weeks ago when we had our baby dedication. And um, I think you'll see why as we, uh, as we get into um, this verse or these verses, we are starting a new uh, a new series uh, this morning that we are entitling "Dwell." And uh, the idea behind this series is um, uh, going along with the truth that you and I uh, have the opportunity to dwell in the presence of the Lord in many ways. Uh, but one of those key ways is through uh, the the words of the Scriptures of the Bible. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, this series and this emphasis. Uh, and let me just say, I, I think that it's, it's things like this that go along with revival. Um, you know, you, you, you've probably certainly seen um, uh, a lot of things uh, in our media uh, over the last uh, several weeks that point to and speak of Revival and something that is uh, that is true is that uh, throughout the history of the church, God has brought about different seasons of revival, uh, and 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 one of the beautiful things about revival when it comes is maybe nobody even saw it coming, right? But there it is, and God through His Spirit uh, does just incredible and amazing things. But one of the things that I think is is true also about revival is kind of getting back to the basics uh, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Over the last several weeks, we've, we've talked about prayer, right, in our series on the Lord's Prayer. We spent 40 days in prayer uh, together as a church. Um, and so uh, similarly, we wanted to move uh, from that prayer emphasis. Certainly, we don't want to lose our prayer emphasis by any means. But really coupled with that is this idea of spending time uh, with God um, in, his, in his word. Uh, I looked at my, uh, my Facebook friends list um, a few days ago. Have you ever gone through your friends list and, and, um, and, and thought about how many of these people do I actually know? Um, now it is true, you know, being a being a preacher, there's a lot of connections and things that are uh, maybe a little bit uh, a little bit different than if I had maybe another profession. And so maybe sometimes the profession brings that about, uh, right? And so 
Uh, but, but I look through that list, and, and there's some people that are on that list that I'll actually say to myself, man, I used to know them. But if I'm fully honest with myself, I don't really know them anymore. Like, I know their name, and I might know who they married, and I might know, uh, you know, what maybe something about where they are living. But I don't really know them. And it's one of these reminders that while we are uh, in a time in history where we are more connected, we have more options to connect than we have ever had before, we are probably more isolated than we have ever been. Isn't that crazy how that works? May it never be that that is indicative of our relationship with God as well. Because I think not only do we, do we experience this disconnectedness in our interpersonal relationships, I, I believe that we as a society, um, and maybe it's because of the speed of our society, the busyness of our society, that maybe we are more disconnected with God than we've ever been before as well. My prayer is, is that that is not the case. My prayer is, is that, that maybe in this season of revival that we can be people who are longing to be in God's presence, who are longing for this connection with God, where we're not okay with this, this idea that, well, God's my Facebook friend and I can message him any time. <laughs> but instead, we, we're able to talk about this, this close relationship that we have with the Lord, this, this, this constant conversation that we have with him as we pray without ceasing, as we look into his word, as we, as we, as we tell him, God, I'm, I'm not where I should be, I'm not who I should be, but I'm praying that you would make it so. God, I'm praying that you would transform me. I'm praying that the things that are not of you, that are in me, that you would change those things, that you would shape me into the image and the likeness of Jesus. But in order for that to happen, communication really, really matters. And it's my prayer that as we emphasize dwelling with the Lord and his word, that we would learn the part of communication that is us, um, it's us hearing from him through the scriptures. We hear from him through his spirit. We hear from him through prayer. We hear from him through the scriptures. It's interesting. Uh, a third of Americans who attend a Protestant church regularly, 32%, basically a third, say that they read the Bible personally every day. Now, you can look at that as a low number or a high number. Uh, I looked at it fairly pessimistically. I was thinking, man, that seems like a low number. Um, about a quarter, so 27 more percent, say that they read it a few times a week. Then fewer say that they only read it once a week, that's 12%. And then a few times a month is 11%, or once a month, 5%. Close to one in eight admit that they rarely or never read the Bible. One of the things that is, uh, that is interesting to me about that is, is that every one of those numbers, right, is, is, is below... It's, it's, it's below 50%, right? It seems very low. And I think it's indicative of the fact that we, in general, in the Western church, um, we, we, we have this idea that following Jesus and being in his word is simply taken care of by coming to church on Sunday mornings. And hoping that the guy who's up there preaching has done something uh, in, in his study to give me something that's going to be good to get me through the week. Right? May that never be. Right? When, when, you, when you look into uh, the history of the church and you look into the church in the first century. Right? It, it, the, the, the way that they would meet together was much different than what the ways that we meet together today. It was in homes, it was conversation where they would be talking about the teachings of the, uh, of the apostles, right? They would be considering the words in the Old Testament scriptures as well, right? They would be talking about these things, they would be praying for one another. Uh, there, would, there would be an atmosphere where multiple people would talk. 
It wouldn't be um, in, in, in most situations uh, someone coming up and doing the act of preaching. Now that has developed through the years, right? It's become something that we have been accustomed to. But, but p- part of the problem with that is that, that oftentimes we can say, you know what, that's the thing for the professionals to do. It's Clint's job to read through the scriptures and to study the scriptures and then tell me what it means, right? I am, look, I am not like your friend in high school where you forgot to read the, uh, the chapters before and you ask me, hey, what, did we, what were we supposed to read so that you can get the test right? Right? That's, not, that's not how this works. What we are called to, one of the things that we are called to as people who are following after Jesus is that we are people who are, who are pouring over the scriptures, who are spending time with him in this way. Um, Brian emphasized it a little bit earlier, the Dwell app that, um, that we had up there on the screen just a little bit earlier. There's a QR code, you can scan that. Um, the, the reason that we're trying to promote that app, we're not getting any money from, from the Dwell app people. Um, we're promoting it because it is an opportunity uh, to, uh, to interact with the scriptures in a, in a new way. Uh, th- this, is, this is a way to interact with the scriptures that really, I mean, you don't have any excuse. right? If you say, you know, I work too much, I just don't, like this, th- this does it for you. right? It reads to you. Um, it's a scripture listening app, and um, I think that's such a valuable tool. We actually have a Creekside group on it uh, that, that scanning the code will take you then to, and you can join that group. There's a playlist um, looking at the scriptures that we're going to be looking at um, in this series. Uh, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to interact with the Lord through the words of the Bible. I want to read this out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Those words are the words of uh, um, there in Deuteronomy 6 that are known as the Shema. Uh, Shema just means hear or listen. Uh, And it's coming from that first word, hear, O Israel, or listen, Israel. Hey, this is an important, important thing that you are about to be told. And the words of this uh, this scripture uh, are ones that are very precious still uh, to the Jews today. Uh, It's something that that Stephanie and I came into uh, into contact with when we went uh, and and got to visit uh, Israel. Um... Uh, the, the, many of the Jews there very much take these words incredibly literally. Uh, so much so that they really do bind the words that are written here in the Shema on their hands and on their heads. Um, and and it's, so, it's, it's so interesting to see uh, some, of the, uh, some of the Jewish rabbis uh, and even just Jews in general that are wearing uh, these phylacteries on their heads that have little scrolls in them that have the words of Deuteronomy 6 in it, right? I mean, they are taking this thing seriously. And one of the things that you can say for uh, so many of the Jewish people is that the words of the scriptures are precious to them. They are precious to them. Uh, and they, and they, they um, uh, spend uh, hours and hours poring over the words of the scriptures But the words that are here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 are especially precious. And so I I want to unpack uh, some of the things that uh, that we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to start off with this idea uh, that I'm just going to call the core. The core. It starts off with this idea. First of all, the Lord is one. There's no one else besides him. Right? He is one God. 
Uh, and, and, and since there is no other beside him, there is no other person, there is no other God who is worthy of giving your love to. And since there is only one, you should give all of your love to this God. There's no other place that's worthy. There's no other place that's wise to place your love. And here in the words of the Shema, he talks about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. The heart um, in, in the ancient world was really considered the place where uh, the seat of the intellect was. Um, you know, a lot of times in our culture, we... We, we lose in translation what's going on here because we kind of separate our mind, right, and our thoughts, our intellect with our heart. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes when we use terminology that says, like, I'm just going to follow my heart, what we mean is I'm going to follow my feelings. And a lot of times that just means leaving your mind completely out of it, right? Um, but in, uh, in Jewish thought, the idea of the heart was that this is where the seat of the intellect is. This is the core of your being. Right? And it's described here, your heart, your soul, or, or, or your, uh, the, the, the fullness of the person that you are with all of your strength. You're supposed to love God with all of these things. And, and this really brings to mind this idea that you see then carried uh, throughout the scriptures. And you see it carried even in the teachings of Jesus. Right? That the heart really matters. Jesus talked about this again and again. Right? When, when he went to the Pharisees and tried to get them uh, to, to understand the problems with the the way and the, the the people that they had become and the way that they were trying to honor God what did he do he went to the heart he said look you look really good on the outside these phylacteries and things that you wear I mean you're wearing the things on your heads you got them tied on your hands but there's nothing going on in here right there's an internal thing that is not going along with the thing that is in the external. And this is a teaching of Jesus, where Jesus is saying, look, it starts with your heart, and then your actions flow out of your heart. And so whatever you do, whatever you say, is a reflection of what is happening in your heart. And it's interesting that in these, uh, in these words of the Hebrew Shema, it's this clear indication Right, that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then these words are to be on your heart. Right, it's this direct connection. It's this direct connection uh, in loving God with all of your heart that these words are to be on your heart. And, and, and one of the things that I, that I think we are being introduced here to here is the idea that the scriptures have some incredible power uh, over the hearts of men. The scriptures have some incredible power over the hearts of human beings where, where it, there, there's a transformative nature to them. The teaching goes on. To say, you know what, you, you, need to, you need to tie these on your hands. You need to tie them on your foreheads. It needs to be on your gates. It needs to be written on your door frames. Why? Because we are people who are very likely to forget the things that are important. The idea that I, I think is uh, being described here uh, is one that I would say everything, everywhere, every moment. Everything, everywhere, every moment. Now certainly some of the Jews do uh, take this very far in saying, okay, if we're supposed to tie it on our foreheads, I'm going to tie it on my forehead. If we're supposed to tie it on our hands, I'm going to tie it on my hands. If it's going to be on my gate, any gate that I have is going to have this thing, right? And it kind of speaks to the human nature that we have that a lot of times we like to, uh, we like to take things that are given to us uh, and turn them into legalistic things. Right? I don't think that's what the scripture is getting at. I don't think it's necessarily saying, hey, you need to like, write these on your foreheads. Right? I mean, face tattoos are popular these days. We could do that. Right? Um, I'd, I'd lose my job. But, you know, um, there would be right there. We could do that. 
But I think what it's speaking to is it's saying, look, you need to be interactive. You need to have opportunities to interact with the truth of the scriptures day in and day out in your comings and goings, wherever it is that you find yourself. Uh, we've actually at our, at our home uh, done a couple, of, uh, a couple of different things that I think um, uh, might be our version of uh, placing them on our, on our door frames. Um, uh, we've got the words um, there uh, on, our, uh, on our mantle, right? His mercies are new every morning, right? Such an important reminder every day, and that has always meant so much to me since Stephanie put that up um, in, in our home. It's always meant so much to me that I look at those words and I'm reminded of those words from the scriptures that say, look, his mercies are new every morning and I'm reminded of his unfailing love for me. And so let me say, there are some practical and beautiful things that can come from posting the scriptures, right? There's some practical and beautiful things uh, from even placing the scriptures. I've, I know people who have bracelets. I know people who have necklaces, right, that are reminders of the words of truth. And why is that important? Because there's so many lies, right? We have an enemy that is hard at work every day trying to, um, trying to divert our attention from that which is true. And having the scriptures there and available and among us and our comings and our goings, it's an opportunity to be reminded of the things that are true. Um, I think there's another thing that this uh, that this passage is really getting at is that this is this is something that will that will set you apart, right? It, it makes it obvious to others who you are and 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 whose you are. Uh, it's a it's a visual reminder uh, of those things. Uh, I kind of liken it. Uh, to, um, uh, you know, I could, I could talk all day saying that I am an Oklahoma Sooners fan, right? But if you look through the stuff in my office, if you look through the stuff in my house, you know that that isn't true, right? I am a Texas Tech fan, good for, for better or worse, right? Uh, and, and those things really speak to the truth of it, Um. Sometimes I think we miss this opportunity um, in, in, in things being posted and th as reminders to us of the greatness of God's love. We miss an opportunity also to speak to that which we truly love. Right? And, and, and there, is a, there seems to be a connection that is being made here um, in, in, the, in the Hebrew Shema for the way that we love the Lord is something that then we show in, in even visible ways. See, sometimes we get this idea that loving God is something that's, you know, it's just a heart thing. It's just, it's just a thing between you and God. The problem with that is, is we're taking, uh, we're, we're not taking into account the truth of the matter, that it's the heart that causes actions. And if it's the heart that causes actions, then the love that we have for God is going to be something that is shown. It's going to be something that is there and is obvious. And, and um, even taking uh, simple opportunities like this is a way to show that. Um, and it's not simply just a show. It's because we believe that the words of the scriptures uh, are, are words of life. We believe that they are God-breathed. Right? This isn't just a, a matter of you know, carrying around a really big Bible saying, my Bible's bigger than yours. Right? And it's crazy to say that, but that's essentially what the Jews did, right? They made their phylacteries big and their tassels long, right? Trying to show how holy they were. The problem is, is they didn't catch the fact that this is supposed to be something that changes your heart. Something that's true is when God breathes into something, it is giving life to something. You can look at that even back in creation. Right when he breathed the breath of life into people. And he's still doing that to you and me today. Second Timothy 3 reminds us of this, that all scripture 
is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we believe that God breathed the scriptures, right? Now, something to keep in mind is that here in 2 Timothy, the scriptures that they are talking about is actually the words of the Old Testament, right? But, but then uh, we, we understand and know that for us today, it's also true with the New Testament as well. But it's God breathed, right? And it's useful for teaching. And we're good with the, re- with the teaching. The rebuking, maybe not, Right? Maybe if we could just skip over that one, but there is a reality that if you are reading the scriptures and interacting with the scriptures in an honest way, there will be times that the scriptures in their nature rebuke you, right? And and we think that rebuke is this terrible and awful thing, and we want to avoid all rebuke. Sometimes rebuke is the most loving thing that we can experience. And I would say that always with God, when that rebuke is coming from him, it's the kind of rebuke that says, don't go this way, go this way. Because I know in this way is death and in this way is life. And so follow me. Correcting, training in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped. What's the whole idea of discipleship? What is discipleship all about? Discipleship is all about being equipped and trained into being people who are like the one that we follow. The the whole idea of discipleship is being trained and equipped in, in, in becoming like the one that we follow. In, in, in the ancient biblical world, that's what it meant to follow a rabbi, is to, is to be someone who followed so closely after that rabbi that, that you learned to do the things that he, that he did and think the ways that he thinks. And there's a reality that in order for that to happen, there has to be a constant nature to that relationship. Right, if you've ever had somebody in your life that was a that was a true mentor to you where at some point or another you may you may have even sought them out and said you know I really want to be like you I want to spend some time with you that that time factor is something that cannot be omitted in order for that uh, for that training and that equipping to take place it's paramount in order for you to start being like that person And one of the things that's amazing to me is that we who are Jesus followers have this opportunity of a rabbi who said, hey, you know what, I want you here with me. I want you to follow me. I want want you to, to, to be near to me. And so often because I don't know if it's just the busyness of life, I don't know if it's the chaos of our culture, I don't know if it's the enemy specifically working on us to divert our attention, so often we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, eh, you know, Sunday's coming. But there's this opportunity that you and I have to have transformed hearts. Transformed hearts. Transformed hearts and transformed creation. I want us to think about this idea. Why is it that we read the scriptures? Um, we have to be careful with this why, the reason why. And history tells us we have to be, we have to be careful with this why. Right? You, you can look at people of God throughout history and see that, that, that this, can get really, uh, this can get really off if you're not careful about, about the heart of the matter and what it is ultimately all about in following after the Lord. Right, because we can start to get very self-righteous. You know what? I read through the Bible three times in one year. Right? I don't know how you do that, and there's a lot of words there. Or, you know, I man, there is not a night of the week that I have not had a Bible study. (laughs) 
How many do you go to? Hmm. Once a week. All right. Interesting. We have that tendency, right? And it, it's, it's maybe a, a, a modern day example of what was happening with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, uh, were a sect that very much knew the scriptures. They had poured over the scriptures since the time that they were young. But the problem is, is that somewhere or another, the message of those scriptures became a moot point. And it, and it became simply about, you know what, I'm going to memorize this thing. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to check these boxes. We have to be very careful that we don't approach it in that way. Or we, too, may have the opportunity to be like whitewashed tombs, right, where things look good on the outside, but on the inside... It's not so much. See, this is an idea. The, the idea behind this is, is to have transformed hearts. It is a beautiful thing to know that you and I can be new in Christ. That you, that you and I, we, we, our old life is gone. Our old self is gone. The sin that entangled us. The sin that sometimes still rears its head in our lives is something that we are made new from. That we are transformed into his likeness and into his image. And one of the things that I think we have to understand is the transformative nature of the scriptures and the the role of the scriptures in this renewal. Have you ever been reading through a scripture and said, oh, I don't know what I think about that? Right? I don't know. Because here's the thing. If you're really digging into the scriptures, you will run into things that you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can do. Can we just turn the page? Maybe pretend that we didn't read that one. Go to the next chapter that's a little bit more palatable to me. Right? Why do we have those experiences? We have those experiences because his ways are not our ways. That his thoughts are not our thoughts. But through discipleship, our ways can become more his ways. Our thoughts can become more his thoughts. Our minds can become more in, in line with the mind of Christ. These transformed hearts. And it's connected to a transformed creation. N.T. Wright says it this way in, in describing that relationship between a transformed heart and transformed creation. He says the Bible isn't simply there to be an accurate reference point for people who want to look things up and be sure that they've got them right. It is there to equip God's people to carry forward his purposes of a new covenant and a new creation. I want to read that again. The Bible isn't simply there to be an accurate reference point for people who want to look things up and be sure that they've got them right. It is there to equip God's people to carry forward his purposes of a new covenant and a new creation. There's a good possibility that over the last several weeks you have prayed for revival. I know that I have. I know that I've looked at the things that have happened at Asbury and and other college campuses throughout the country. Things that I've heard about at different churches and different groups that are experiencing this kind of revival. And we pray, Lord, bring about revival. And this interesting thing that I think happens whenever we pray for revival is, is that oftentimes we think we're praying for someone else. Sure, I'm glad he's getting to those college kids because, man, they're wild these days. Right? Or, uh, yeah, I really am praying for revival for that person because of that thing that happened. Church, something that we have to understand is that revival starts with you. Revival starts with you. And we don't just read through these scriptures to be sure that we've got our facts right, but rather we read through these scriptures to be equipped and to be trained into being new creations, right? And and not just being new creations, but then being people who are bringing about new creation. 
Revival starts with you and a transformed heart. A transformed creation starts at the simplest point, and that is in you and me. This is not an academic exercise. This is people who have been changed simply doing what changed people do. And it perpetuates, and the kingdom comes. Let's pray together. God, we, uh, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. God, there's so many people in this world who don't have the access that we have to the words of your scriptures. I... God, so often we, it, the Bible becomes this just old hat to us. It might become something that just gathers dust on our shelves. God, I pray that we would long to meet you in the words of the scriptures. God, I pray that we would open up our hearts as we do so, that you would transform us, you would change us. God, we want to see revival, and we pray that you would bring that revival in each of us first. We love you, we thank you, we pray these things in Christ. You may be someone who uh, has come this morning and you have a particular need. Maybe that need is just as simple as, you know what, I really need to get in the Word more. I, I would love it if that was your takeaway today. I need to be in the Word. You may be somebody who is realizing that you've been carrying a burden that you were never meant to carry. There's an opportunity to lay that down. You may be someone who's ready to take your first step ever towards Jesus. And there's an opportunity for that as well. Wherever you lie, uh, my, my, my prayer is, is that, that God would speak to you wherever you are this morning. We've got some prayer cards here on the front stage. You can feel free to go and take one of those cards and pray for someone this week. But however it is that we're called to respond, I pray that we would. And so let's stand and sing this song together. calling us to this, this life of, of walking with you and being discipled. And we know that you've given us your word as a, as, a, as a tool that you can use to disciple us, that you can use to shape us and lead us and 
convict us and change us, Lord. So let us be tuned to your spirit and let us be saturated with your, your words and the story of your goodness, Lord, that we would see your character in the pages of scripture and that we would be inspired through that time with you to just be more like you each day. So help us, help us, God, to do that. Help us to have that discipline and that desire, and that hunger to, to, to follow you into scripture and into time with you. And ears listening to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, family. Have a good Sunday. Go pick up those kiddos. <laughs>